Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckus join me shortly in our topics this week. Your attention, please. Your new airport scheduled arrival has been delayed. The long delayed IG report on the Clinton email investigation is now public. And Mayor James wants the public to approve yet another sales tax. Plus, of course, roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and focus on issues that are a frequent part of the day's news, immigration and immigration law. Those topics have been front and center the past several days as immigrant parents and children have been separated as they enter the U.S. at the southern border. Here to discuss immigration issues with us is Reka Sharma Crawford, an immigration attorney in Kansas City. Reka, thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate you doing so. Thank you. In your private law practice, what are some of the immigration issues that you frequently encounter? Well, I mean, right now, obviously, the family detention issues are big. Uh, children who are going through removal proceedings, uh, removal defense, individuals who are trying to uh, obtain their status, um, and then also family sp family based sponsors. So, if you are if you're married to a citizen or you have a, a relative that you're petitioning for, so those are the types of cases that we take on. There was a lot of controversy over separating parents and children at the border, and it's been all over television, a newspaper, radio, throughout the media. A lot of people have been very upset. Uh, President Trump issued an executive order to stop the separation. Is that going to solve the problem? I don't think it will. I think it's, I, I think it's, when you read the executive order, the executive order doesn't say um, release the children. It says make bigger, bigger facilities to house the whole family. Um, so I think that's going to cause more issues. It's not necessarily going to solve the issue. Um, it may temporarily solve the issue of, of having the separation between uh, the children and the parents, but I don't think in the grand scheme of things it will get completely solved. So under issue. this present executive order, they can be housed together, children and parents, for a minimum of 20-some days if you follow a court order. I think it's called the Flores decision. Right. So the Flores decision actually came in 1997. Yeah. Um, and in, in, the de in that decision, what it came about is, is it was under, it's called Flores v. Reno. And it was then Janet Reno, um, who they, and the policy was to hold, you know, when children would come to the border, they would hold them. And at the time, the court said, look, you can't do that. You can't just put children in definite, indefinite custody um, without some kind of, of, uh, of, of safeguards. Because I mean, the, the United States government is not in the in the business of creating daycare prisons, right? Um, well, it may so, be now. Well, and, and and ironically, they've asked the the district court judge to allow for them uh, for these facilities to be licensed as daycare. To modify the Flores right. decision. Right. Um, so I think that that's still there. Uh, the Flores decision, of course, as part of the executive order, he has asked to modify it. All right, we, we hear people talk about immigration rights, and you deal with immigration rights. What rights does a person receive automatically when he or she enters the country without permission, illegally, you, undocumented, whatever term you prefer? Well, I mean, there are constitutional protections. The Constitution does not speak in terms of illegal or unillegal, right? Uh, they talk in terms of citizens, and there are certain rights that are reserved to citizens, but there are also rights that are said to be of person, right? So those rights are things like unlawful seize, uh, uh, seize, uh, searches and seizures, uh, the right to the Fifth Amendment, um, the right to due process. I mean, these are all concepts that are meant and in, in the Constitution listed as towards the person. So there are rights that yeah. this country grants to people who enter illegally or undocumentedly or whatever? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. look, you can't, you can't strip away the fact that they're still a person. Yeah. Uh, do other countries extend these rights as broadly and generously as this country does? Um, I think there, it depends on the country, obviously. Mexico. Um, I think Mexico, there are, there are rights that Mexican citizens have that, you know. But, um, but immigrants, not Mexican citizens. You know, I'm not a scholar on Mexican law, but what I can tell you is, is that asylum seekers internationally and universally are treated differently. And so I think there is a difference between an individual who is fleeing persecution 
and someone who's not fleeing persecution. I guess what I'm trying to get at is this country humane in its treatment, generally speaking, of those who enter illegally? Currently, no. No? I would say no. I would say that if you look at the detention facilities, we, we, and, and you look at the, uh, the opportunities that are taken away, um, you know, due process issues are fundamentally uh, outlined in the Constitution, and they do not exist right now. Um, we know that the Attorney General has said he wishes to do uh, away with due process for individuals who, are, who do come in and may have a, a legitimate way to remain or even ask to remain. Um, the conditions of, of due process in the country are an, at risk, and I will tell you that the current treatment of those at the southern border, they should be, they should be concerning to most individuals. But there's not an inherent right to just come into the United States and live here if you choose to. Of course not, yeah. and no one is advocating and, and for that. And countries have to have enforceable borders, we'd all agree Absolutely. on that, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's true. We're running short on time, as we always do, unfortunately. I wish we could go on for many more uh, minutes. But uh, finally, if you could unilaterally make one significant change in immigration law, what would you change? I think what I would change if it was immigration laws, I would have people who actually function at the border and function at, you know, who do this for a living at the table making policy. I think so often policy is made in a theoretical way that it does, it's unworkable and unsustainable. And that's why you see things that, like what's going on at the southern border happen. Tough issue and a lot to talk about. You did it very well. Thank you very much for coming Thank in. You. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. That is attorney Rekha Sharma Crawford. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Lisa Johnston is a consultant and columnist. Patrick Tuey is director of municipal policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. John Stevens is the head of Rock Hill Strategic. And attorney Steve Marakian is with the firm of Warsh, Hobbs and Marakian and the author of the latest Trump biography, Pardon Me. <laughs> now this should be an outstanding panel. Let's find out if indeed it is. <laughs> well, if you've been eagerly awaiting the arrival of a new airport, you will have to wait eagerly for another six months to a year. The original opening date was set for November 2021. This change could push the opening to May or November of 2022. Now, there's nothing easy about planning and building a new airport. You'll recall all the confusion and debate that went on before last year's vote. But even with the complexity and uncertainty, do Kansas Cityans who voted overwhelmingly to support this construction have a right to feel misled and let down? Or should they just say the only thing that's consistent is inconsistency and move on? John, what do you think? Well, I don't think they should feel misled, but I do think that they should uh, sit up and pay attention and start asking more questions. Uh, I think anybody that was selected to build this airport coming through this process uh, at City Hall and the delays that came out of that uh, would have known and should have known. And I think Edgemore should have telegraphed uh, how the timeline would shift uh, after uh, all of that transpired and what it was going to take to make those changes and implement those changes. So I certainly fault Edgemore. I don't fault Edgemore in where they are in the process. I think they're doing uh, a, a good job. I fault them in their communication. Uh, and uh, then I, I also question uh, where City Hall is going to go with uh, all the mayoral candidates because I think anybody should have projected uh, that many of these mayoral candidates were going to uh, try to use this as a wedge issue uh, in an upcoming campaign. Patrick, do you recall being told that there might be delays in the opening of the new airport? I don't know that we were told that. Uh, I think, by the way, I think anybody who lives in Kansas City is probably used to misinformation and, and disappointment when it comes to City Hall. I don't know that we were explicitly told that, but, but, but everything leading up to this point was, was staging it. We basically were asked to give uh, City Hall a blank check on building an airport. None of these important details uh, were, were in, uh, were specifically listed when we voted, and, and they should have been. And, and although I think huge uh, a project like this, it, it's reasonable to accept some delays, what troubles me about this is apparently the aviation department did not understand FAA regulations when it comes to environmental processes, and that's inexcusable. I, I will allow a few months for this and that, but when, when the FAA has to tell you, uh, what you're doing is wrong, that's, that's a red flag, and I think uh, Councilman Reed was exactly right in the hearing to point that out. 
Lisa, should this make uh, voters and city council people rethink the decision to hire Edgemore, an out-of-town firm? I don't know that we're at that point yet, but they need to keep an eye on it because if there continue to be issues and problems, then yes, potentially. I mean, I think it was a mistake to essentially overpromise and now be potentially under-delivering. And if they can't really bring this to fruition in the way that you know, the city feels that it needs to be, then yeah, they need to reconsider. Steve, would there have been more pressure on a local firm like Burns and McDonald to get the opening date right? Well, I, I think the, my answer would be yes. I, I, I thought Burns and McDonald should have been chosen to begin with. In fact, that was one of the points they yeah, made. We're and, local, and, we'll and, be judged And, I, and I'll tell you, I will harshly. tell you that I understand that, as, as everyone has said here, there can be delays. Starting right now, before they've done anything really, and saying, okay, we're going to push everything back by six months, in my view, is nonsense. My son works for the, the, probably the best architecture firm in the world, Populous. They designed stadiums around the world, event centers. They built the bird's nest in China a few years ago for the Olympics, okay? They wouldn't ask for it. They wouldn't need a six-month delay. They would have had this thing lined up and ready to go. Burns and McDonald would have worked with Populous. That was part of the plan. And they would have gotten this job done. I do not believe Burns and McDonald would be having this problem. And I think, as Patrick said, it is absolutely inexcusable and does cause me to question the selection of Edgemore when somebody says, gee, we're building an airport, but gosh, we never checked with the FAA as to the environmental regulations. Are you kidding me? That's nonsense. And I believe we were misled. And John, you said this will be an issue in next year's mayor's election. What are they going to argue about? <laughs> well, I, I think you can, you can already hear uh, many of the candidates arguing about, I warned, uh, I, I warned everyone of this. did most of them this. vote for it? Uh, well, they, they, I think most of them did end up yeah. voting for it. But many of them were, were already telegraphing uh, how they wanted to utilize this as an issue in the election. You said you would vote for it before I said I would vote for it. <laughs> Maybe that's it. All right. I don't think it is unfair to say there are lots of sales taxes in Kansas City, Missouri. There are city, county, and state sales taxes. In some areas, there are taxes for the CIDs, Community Improvement Districts, or the TDDs, Transportation Development Districts. If Mayor James and the Chamber of Commerce have their way, you may be paying close to 10% sales tax or more in some areas. The proposal is a sales tax hike of three-eighths of a cent. The purpose is to fund pre-K, pre-kindergarten education for young children in the city. If plans proceed, the question will appear on the November ballot. While everyone wants to improve education for young children, or say they do, is this project worth pursuing? And we will start with Patrick. Uh, well, the, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, we don't have any details from what the uh, mayor may be proposing. Uh, in, in fact, we don't know how much exactly this will collect. We don't know who will administer it, and we don't know how it will be spent. Other states have adopted uh, pre-K programs. Some have been great, uh, some have uh, not been so good, and some of the studies of pre-K are questionable. So it's not just a matter, as people in Kansas City understand, it's not just a matter of saying, gosh, we support this thing, let's raise taxes. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't tell us that we'll get a good product. What's curious about this for me is that the sales tax will, will raise uh, approximately $30 million a year and that is exactly, almost exactly the amount of money that Kansas City is diverting away from the Kansas City Public School District in the form of TIF. Guys, why doesn't Mayor James go to his millionaire buddies at Cerner, at Burns and Mac, at J.E. Dunn, at H&R Block and say, you know what, give back the money that you've taken from taxpayers and we can fund a pre-K program. Lisa, you've been an educator over the years. Uh, should this be better left to the Kansas City School District and school districts within Kansas City, Missouri, as opposed to the city council and mayor? Well, I think it would be dangerous to leave it to the school district. They uh, have plenty of fish to fry to, you know, clean up their own issues and challenges. But there and, are 12 other districts, I think, at least 13 well, sure, or so in Kansas City, sure. Missouri. I think that, you know, there could be merit to a pre-K program, and a high-quality pre-K has benefits. But the real question, as Patrick was getting at, is, is this the right way to do it, the sales tax? And I have concerns about it. And I think if they put this on the ballot, it may not be as warmly received as they're hoping, especially from seniors 
who are often on restricted incomes or those just who have lower incomes generally, they may not want to see their sales tax continue to be ratcheted up and up and up. Steve, what do we think the benefits are of pre-K education? Uh, generations and generations of people have survived and done fairly well without it. Well, uh, and, and that's a really good question, and the, my answer is I don't know, precisely because there are studies and there are studies. And some say that kids don't benefit by pre-K at all. It's just glorified daycare. Other studies say, yes, it does help, particularly in, in, in areas where kids are perhaps living with, uh, in, w without getting education at home and so forth. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the subject, so I think I'd go back to what Lisa said. The question is, is it going to be high quality? And my problem is that when you, when you have something like through the city council, I think the school district would be a terrible place to make this decision because they've shown us they can't make good decisions for educating kids in Kansas City. The problem is that they don't know how to develop a high quality program and I don't think it ought to be something that a sales tax ought to be funding. If there are ways to fund it in other ways and if you can study it and come up with a high quality program, it might be beneficial to some kids. My own personal experience that I have had in representing clients, people have had kids in pre-K, people have worked in pre-K programs in rural areas and so forth, they have told me without exception it is an abysmal failure, it is nothing more than daycare and the money is virtually all wasted. That doesn't mean that there can be no good pre-K programs. I'm not a proponent. Uh, John Mayor James is pretty good at selling the public on a project. Could he sell this? Uh, the short answer is no. I, I don't believe no? so. But I, I will say that that I want to pray. I would praise him, and, and I would praise the fact that we're having this conversation about pre-K because it is an important conversation to have. Uh, there are studies, um, and there are variable <clears throat> studies, but there are studies that show that it certainly helps. Uh, children that come from disadvantaged circumstances. It helps elevate them and helps prepare them better for a traditional education environment. I think that's important. I think the sales tax uh, idea being tossed out there uh, rightfully has met with a thud, and it should, and I think we should look at other funding sources, but the fact that we're having this conversation and that we're willing to advance this conversation about pre-K, I think is a very valuable conversation to have. I'm gonna change the topic here for the last 30, 40 seconds of this segment. <laughs> Uh, no one, I think, was surprised by the outcome of the streetcar expansion vote. It was overwhelmingly in favor. And uh, Patrick, good good decision. Well, when you get to choose the people that vote for your plan, uh, <laughs> very uh, anti-democratic. Right? Yeah, it, it was absolutely gerrymandered by design. By the way, every time the city has gone to the people of Kansas City and proposed a streetcar, it's been defeated. So they came up with an alternative. But but what's important, and and I've got a post about this today, and I think which the Star didn't cover, is that uh, the the Jackson County Court said that you may not collect local taxes until you have federal funding. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. right now, the federal government has said no to Kansas City until 2021, when it zeroes out the program that Kansas City is counting on. So this, uh, the, the, vera, the, the, the victory may be meaningless because they can't collect local until they get federal and the federal money isn't coming. All right. And uh, we have no guarantee that it ever will be coming. That's right. Okay. Wall Street Journal columnist Kimberly Strassel, who followed the Clinton email investigation from the outset, says the 500 plus page report from the Justice Department's Inspector General can be summarized in two words insubordination and bias. Others certainly disagree. The report followed an extensive investigation into how the FBI, headed by James Comey, and the Justice Department by Loretta Lynch, handled their investigation into the allegations that presidential candidate Hillary Clinton had used unauthorized emails and servers to send and receive government information, some of which was classified or secret, during her tenure as Secretary of State. So first question, was Strassel's use of insubordination and bias to describe the report accurate or simply a display of Strassel's own conservative bias? Steve? Well, it, it, was, it was not only accurate, it was a gross understatement. The, the, um, the fact of the matter is, and I've studied this very carefully because I, in full disclosure, I'm representing a former FBI agent who essentially was forced out because he had the audacity to say to a reporter that he thought this is months and months and months ago that he thought Comey had bungled the Clinton investigation. For that, he was essentially drummed out by the FBI. So I've been following this. I don't know about the other people here, but I've read virtually all of the report, and it's a lot of reading. But the bottom line is, that report is chock full of extremely important information. You know, we have a situation here where, where when you talk about bias or you talk about um, insubordination, 
It's incredible. It's astounding. Virtually the top six people in the FBI were either fired or forced out. Th that's not something that happens just because somebody made a mistake. The, 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 the information that has been gleaned through this report of things that Strzok did, that McCabe did, that Comey did, the lying, the disingenuous information, the absolute, and this is no exaggeration, absolute lying to Congress and to the IG is appalling. And this is something that, that when you look at this, you know, people can, the, the president can try, for example, to say this exonerates him in the Russia probe. It doesn't. But th there's all kinds of political gibberish going back and forth. But if you are an honest, fair evaluator and you read this report, what you find is the IG intentionally understated. And we have, what we have is referrals now. We may see actual prosecutions and should see them. This was absolutely it's one of the worst things in a government agency that's ever happened in this country. Is this covered in your new Trump biography? It's the pardon me one. Yes. Lisa, I want to ask you the same question. Is uh, Kimberly Strassel right or is she just showing her bias? She's right. And I would add it's embarrassing and disappointing. Now, the sad thing is if people only listen to the, listen to the little snippets they hear on the news, they would think it's all about the fact that James Comey ruined Hillary's chances to win the election. And, of course, Comey is rebuked in the report, as well he should be. But there's so much more. And I have read a lot of it myself. And I would encourage folks who have an interest to do so because it's just astounding what's in there. Uh, the FBI was leaving leaking like a sieve, leaks all over the place, people getting incentives from reporters to give them information, all of the errant, inappropriate text messaging going on at work between employees, and the contention that people have these strong beliefs and a hatred toward one individual, but they're not letting that interfere with their work. Just is not even believable on the face of it. John, does this report justify President Trump's dismissal of FBI Director Comey? Uh, probably. Uh, I think that the, the motivation of President Trump to dismiss <laughs> Comey, certainly there were other motivations related to his dismissal of Comey, because I don't think he had, uh, he probably didn't have a full picture of this report uh, or the information behind it at this point. I think he was motivated by other means. Uh, or other reasons. However, uh, that being said, I also, on the other side, I, th I think it, it clearly does not give the, the other argument that that uh, Comey uh, prevented Hillary from becoming president. I, I think both sides of this are, are, are sort of asinine in that, and I think some, there's a deeper, some deeper people, problems. Some people think Hillary prevented Hillary from becoming <laughs> president. Well, and that is correct, and yeah. I don't uh, take responsibility. Okay, Patrick, do you accept the report's finding that the airport tarmac meeting between former President Clinton and Attorney General Loretta Lynch a few days before Mrs. Clinton was to be uh, questioned by the FBI. Do you accept the finding that it was just talk about grandchildren and golf games? I think what the report tells us is that the fix was in long before that meeting. Uh, that meeting was absolutely inappropriate. All the parties should have known this. I don't know what was discussed. If people say that it was it was gardening and grandchildren, I'm fine with that. But it is one small part of a, of a bigger problem. And, and she's criticized in the report for not ending the conversation sooner than she did. The, the implication is she should have realized what this is going to look like. Any adult yeah. should have realized that this was a bad idea. And especially the Attorney General of the United States. Absolutely. Is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah, the optics I think are that's fair to say. astoundingly yeah. ridiculous. And, and nobody would have known except the reporter happened to be wandering through the airport that day and, and saw Clinton getting on the plane or was told about it. Otherwise, it would not have been known. Mm. All right. Now we're going to head to the soapbox for <laughs> roast and toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to amuse, recuse, or suffuse. <laughs> and let us start with Lisa. My roast is for those on both sides of the aisle who are willing to give a pass to improper conduct when it helps their team, but shout from the rooftops about injustice in other instances. We need leaders with enough integrity and intellectual honesty to say when something is wrong and to protest and take a stand each and every time. And Steve. Last Friday, two Wyandotte County deputies were murdered in the line of duty. Today, I salute my friend and camping buddy, Patrick Rohr. Pat was an Eagle Scout. I was his scoutmaster for seven years. Pat exemplified the highest ideals of scouting and what it means to be a good son, husband, father, and citizen of this country. I'm heartbroken for Pat's wonderful parents. 
and his wife and his children. They and we can take solace in knowing that Pat made this crazy world a better place. I'll miss his smile, oh, sorry. and I'll always treasure the role I played in his life. Martin Patrick. Uh, a roast to City Hall and especially the Office of Economic Development for continually bungling a contract they had with a vendor to examine Kansas City's profligate spending on economic development subsidies. The council authorized a payment two times greater than what St. Louis paid for a very similar study, and the report already is a year late. I've been trying for weeks to find out why those extensions were granted and have come up with nothing. I fully expect this report, if it is ever issued, to be a whitewash, but the cost and delays add insult to injury. John. Uh, I'd, I'd like to give a heart-wrenching toast to um, the law enforcement of KCK, uh, the citizens of KCK for how they've responded uh, in, in such a wonderful and thoughtful and meaningful manner uh, to the loss of deputies Warren King. Um, they uh, continue to today, they uh, showed up in the thousands, and they continue to rally around uh, those officers and their families uh, and the rest of our law enforcement community. And finally, here's a toast to National Review magazine for this one-liner in a recent issue, and I quote, Barack Obama signed a contract with Netflix. Now he'll be working for the media instead of the other way around. <laughs> And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.